Alright, for the last presentation in this uh, particular module, we're going to talk about IPv6. Now, IPv6 may seem a bit daunting at first due to the length of addresses and so on, but the concepts behind them are pretty easy and can be researched online. There's lots of resources out there for IPv6. So, here's the idea to the IPv4 shorters that we've talked about so far. You can use translation, but that's kind of a workaround. The idea here is that we need a new addressing space. And so, IPv6 uses a 128-bit address field. That is huge. It allows for 2 to the 128th addresses. That's 48 billion 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 addresses. That's a lot of zeros. Or, no, that's 48 billion 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 addresses per person on the planet. So take that times, you know, 7 billion, and then you've got an idea of what's going on. It's huge address space, and we haven't allocated, haven't even had to allocate that much of it. IPv6 has a much more streamlined header as well, so even though the header itself is, in terms of bytes, bigger, it actually gets processed faster by the routers that receive it because it's more streamlined. There are several obsolete fields that are removed. A few fields have been added or renamed to more accurately reflect their use. IPv6 also integrates several services that require extra work in IPv4. For example, you don't need to do DHCP to get an address. You can also you don't need a NAT. There's also some security features that are added as well. And so here's a comparison of the IPv4 and the IPv6 headers. You'll see they've still got the version field. Rather than talking about IHL and TOS, we have traffic class and flow label. Flow label is used much like TOS is in uh, the IPv4 packet. You have what's payload length, which is a little bit different than the size, but it's fairly close. You have next header, which is used because IPv6 can actually have multiple headers. You have hop limit, which determines the uh, number of hops that could traverse in the maximum. This is actually replacing the time to live that we talked about earlier, because time to live was in seconds, and uh, well, it's not really, you know, routing is typically happened sub-second. So rather than worrying about seconds, we actually renamed it to what it is. It's actually a hop limit. Um, then we have the source and destination addresses. And so IPv6 address assignment occurs as following. IPv4 addresses have basically become fragmented, but the idea here with IPv6 is since we have more space, we can actually more logically divide these addresses up into meaningful parts. And so addresses are going to be grouped by geographic region and then inside of each region you're going to have a subgroup kind of a subnet if you will that's grouped to each service provider and then within service providers they can you know organize those based on possibly geographic area or city block or whatever and then assign them to each host because of this organizing organized addressing the routing table should actually be much shorter resorting in a faster internet and and uh, faster lookup times now, IPv6 addresses are very long, they're 128 bits long, so we have to do something to abbreviate them. The idea here is that IPv6 addresses are written in hex. They separate every two bytes with a colon, so the contiguous quartets of zeros can be removed. You can only remove one of them, though, otherwise we're not sure uh, how many zeros are in which place. So, and any leading zeros in any quartet can be omitted, they're kind of assumed to be there since you have to have a certain number. So here's an example of a nice long address. You'll notice there's tons of zeros in there that we shouldn't even have to worry about. So we can actually just get rid of some of those zeros. So you can write this address two ways. You can remove the first set of, or pardon me, the second set of zeros, which will just be written, may, make it be written like the first one that you see there on the left, or you can remove the first set of zeros, which will make it be written like the one that you see there on the right. And you'll notice that we can only remove one big set of zeros, the first one removes three sets of zeros, and it's actually probably the best way and shortest way to write this, whereas the, the second uh, way that I've written this removes uh, only two sets of zeros and requires three zeros after the one there. And you'll notice we've also omitted the zeros before 5, 6. We don't really need to write those. They're assumed to be there, but we can omit trailing zeros. For example, FE00, we need the two zeros there for that. Um, now we have what's called prefixing, and this kind of ties into the concept of subnetting with IPv4. Uh, so IPv6 is completely classless. The network portion is actually only designated by what's called a prefix, and that prefix length is given in CID or notation. So we're doing away with dot decimal notation for subnet masks, which is going to save people a lot of time. The prefixes range from 0 to 128, which makes sense because there are 128 bits, and allocated ranges can be further divided by extending the prefix length, much like you would extend the subnet mask to further subnet an existing IPv4 network. So, for example, 2000 slash 3 refers to any binary address starting with 0, 0, 001. We look at the first three bits of the address and we figure out that those first three bits are the important bits. And so any I address starting with 0, 0, 001 followed by any other, you know, 126, 125 bits are going to be important. The rest of them don't matter.
And so the idea here, these are some of the different allocated addresses. Um, these are some of the spaces. You will need to know these for the uh, CCNA if you're going to be taking it. You'll need to know be able and be able to identify these different types of addresses and know what types of addresses work and what types don't and what types are used for what purposes. So you can see that so far we've only allocated 2,000 and 3,000 as far as global unicast addresses are concerned. Um, we didn't have some dedicated ranges down here. We have FE80, which is used for link local. We have FC00, which is used for unique local addresses. These are the equivalent of IPv4 private addresses, like the 192.168 uh, networks and the uh, 172.16 subnet that's allocated in IPv4, or 10.0.0.0/8. Uh, unique local addresses are basically the equivalent of that. And then you have the IPv6 multicast, which is FF00/8. Now, uh, address assignment, you can do it manually, just like you can with a static uh, assignment, which is, you know, pretty straightforward. You've done this with IPv4 before. You can also do what's called stateless auto configuration, address auto configuration. Slack is what it's called, and basically the device is given a 64-bit prefix, which is assigned, you know, it's basically advertised by the router, and then the device uses its MAC address with FFFE in the middle to generate the second 64 bits. Now there's also a DHCP that's out there for uh, IPv4, which is basically done with the typical DHCP process. Um, there is also what's called stateless DHCP, where Slack is used for addressing, and then the other information which is pulled from the DHCP server. Uh, the second option, the stateless option, is actually more handy for uh, things where you have, say you want to get a DNS server, because uh, hosts may not, you know, they can assign themselves an address, that's all well and fine, but they don't know where to go to for domain names, so the uh, DHCP servers can still advertise that information. Uh, IPv6 routing protocols, we talked about the IPv4 routing protocols. IPv6 still has RIP. It's called the RIP NG, RIP Next Generation. It also has a version of OSPF, and there's a version of BGP specifically for IPv6. EIGRP for IPv6 has also been implemented by Cisco, so all of your routing protocols that you're familiar with carry up to IPv6. Router solicitation and advertisement is sort of a new process uh, that basically, this is how Slack is performed. So when a device is brought up, it automatically assigns itself a link local address. That's that FE80 that we talked about. And then the device will send what's called a router solicitation to F02 colon colon 2. This is a multicast address that's specifically reserved for routers. All of the routers will be listening on F02 colon colon 2. The nearest router will reply with a router advertisement to F02 colon colon 1. Uh, the FO2 colon colon 1 is the multicast address that's reserved for every single IPv6 host. Now, IPv6 configuration, uh, interface configuration is pretty simple. First, you have to turn on IPv6 with the command IPv6 unicast routing. Then we can configure on an interface an IPv6 address. We specify the address, we specify the prefix if necessary, and optionally there at the end you can see EUI64. This will basically take the prefix that you specify and tack on that MAC address with FFFE in the middle that I talked about earlier. That's called the EUI64 specification. I encourage you to look up EUI64 so that you know how those addresses are constructed. Now for RIP next generation, it's pretty simple. You go IPv6, router RIP, and then the name of the RIP process, um, unlike the uh, OSPF that we talked about in the IGRP, which use process or autonomous system numbers, RIP uh, processes actually use a name for IPv6. And then you can enable IPv6 on an interface uh, by saying IPv6 RIP, and then the name of the process, and then enable. So IPv4 to IPv6 transition is kind of slow. We have to have devices that can run both IPv4 and IPv6 during the transition period. These are called dual stack devices. And then we have to have what's called tunneling so that the routers that don't run IPv6 can still pass IPv6 traffic. The idea here is that we put IPv6 inside of IPv4 headers. This is going to be manually configured. It can be done with what's called 6 to 4, where the V6 address is actually extrapolated based on the V4 address. We have what's called ISATAP, Intrasite Automatic Tunneling Addressing Protocol, and ISATAP is actually really nice because it automatically assigns the IPv6 address. We also have what's called Torito. Uh, Torito is used on primarily hosts, and it encapsulates an IPv6 packet in an IPv4 header, which is pretty streamlined. Now we also have what's called NatPT. NatPT actually just translates directly from an IPv4 address to an IPv6 address, and it's used in the, much the same way NAT is. Now, obviously that's going to be a little bit CPU intensive, but in terms of actual uh, implementation, it's probably going to be the easiest way to go for most people.
that just about wraps it up for IPv6. If you guys have any more questions for me, feel free to ask in the comments below. Again, I encourage you to not just look at the book for this one, but there are all sorts of resources online for IPv6. Um, try to familiarize yourself with the addressing space, know these different address ranges, and, uh, you know, ask questions. Try to play around with a little bit if you can. I mean, I know Windows 7 computers actually do IPv6, so you should be able to implement some of this stuff in the lab as well. Anyway, again, questions and comments, feel free to put them below, and I will see you guys in the next module.